coming tonight. This is a small group, so it's fine. I'm just going to be super casual. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Kristen Chiaccia. I'm the Executive Director and Chief Curator at Second Street Gallery. We're a 501c3 nonprofit art space. This is the last show of our 47th year of continuing programming and exhibitions here in Charlottesville. Um, we were originally located up in McGuffey, and then we moved to another location on Second Street. And now we're on this second street, so we were able to keep our name for those 47 years. Um, so thank you to Lauren and to Sharon for um, for doing this tonight. We thought it would be nice to give um, Common House members, are we a vote? Yeah, members yeah. as well, um, a chance to come and get a you know a private tour and artist talk with yeah. Sharon. And so after Sharon's talk, we have wine. Thank you, Tim, for providing our. <laughs> beverages for the evening. Um, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so after sharing some of the talk, you can um, help yourself to some wine, and um, we also have bottled water if you'd like, and I am going to stop talking because I know we're here to listen to Sharon <laughs> talk about our show, but if you, can, yeah, if you have any questions for you to talk or anything, um, I'm sure
grow up in when things between my parents dissolved. I paint for my grandmother who packed fierceness and passion into her tiny four foot 11 frame. I paint for my mother who gave me the ability to focus on something for an extended period of time. And I paint for my father who I last said goodbye to at age 20 when at a tiny airport in West Virginia when he put me on a plane to study art for the summer in Italy. I don't exclude anyone, and when someone connects with my work, nothing makes me happier. So my work is personal. It is autobiographical. But hopefully it goes beyond that, because it would be a shame if it stopped at my own stories and my own narratives. I see painting as a transmission point from one person to another through the nervous system. So paintings are objects that have the ability to make a person feel. It's a direct experience, unlike so much of what we do every day, which is through a screen. In our virtual world, I mean, in our, in our perceptual world, I think one of the most honest and primal relationships that we have is visual intimacy. It's one of the reasons I think painting is so important. They allow the viewer to open up to a vast range of subtlety. So this is interesting. The body and the brain are fused, as we know. You can't really separate them. Paintings involve both. So an example is I'll get an idea for a painting in my, in my mind, how to execute it. But that idea has to be thrown through my body. And the body has its own intelligence. It has its own ideas. And that changes it. It morphs the idea, what comes through my hand. So I, I see painting and making art as a wonderful opportunity to highlight the connection between the brain and the body and also the distance. So when I make a painting, I'm curating a psychological space. I know that paintings have the power, like literature, to, similar to literature, they, they let us occupy them with our thoughts, they, they ask us to time travel, identify with characters, identify with objects, and in doing so, create empathy. And this is an old question that I've had in for a long time, but it's a magical one. And that is, how do I take pigment, cloth, paper, and hairs from a brush and convey emotion and cause a reaction in a viewer? Well, I try to do that, and I have several ways that I do it, and I'm going to talk about those ways. One way is through memory. So like, like memories and like, well, one way is through fracturing the image. So much like memories and like dreams, they're, they're, they're fractured, or they're cut off, or they're interrupted. So Joan Didion said, Memory, memory shifts, memory conforms to what we think we remember. This is why photographs have always been such an integral part of my process. There's really no object as associated with memory as the photograph. It's almost like the memory resides in the photograph. It responds to our gaze. It asks the question, is it the memory or is it the memory of the photograph? So I think what I find um, interesting about, and another thing I find super interesting about painting is that when you're looking at a painting, you're standing at basically the same distance the artist was when they finished it. And there's something really powerful about that. So in my mind, I think the viewer and the artist are having these conversations off frame forever. Um, time collapses between now and then. So the depicted subjects or the objects may still be around or they may be gone. 
but the actual painting will be here. It will, it, it will be here long after we're here. It's a special intimacy because you're separated by the same surface that contains it. In a nutshell, painting is a way of setting up problems and then trying to solve those problems. It's kind of crazy. That's basically what it is. It's a, it's a series of decisions and then reactions to those decisions. Everything you do is a decision. So that's why I think painting is so tiring. It's exhausting and it's hard, but in the best kind of way. But it, it, but it definitely is. And I know other artists recognize this. So another way that I like to, to cause good trouble, as John Lewis referred to it, is through dislocation. So often I will, memory reads on fragments seen out of context. So often I'll slip an unruly element into a structured scene and that causes linearity to collapse. It causes certainty to unravel. It impacts the psyche. And that, that it raises questions. And I think that's an important feature. I think that's an important thing for art to do is to raise questions. Another tool that I use and have used for a long time is nostalgia. I can say a lot about nostalgia. Nostalgia is tender, it's also sharp. It has the ability to comfort us, it has the ability to wound us. And we all know this, like you're in your car, you're listening to the radio, you're not ready to hear the song from your eighth grade dance, but it comes on, and then all of a sudden you're taken back there. And it's really sweet, but it's also sad, because it was a long time ago. For some of us longer than others. But I see nostalgia as a feminine archetype, like a coercive caregiver. It pulls you in. It says, I'm dying. You're dying. We're all dying, but we're in this together. The American South is a, for it's a, it's a, it's, to me, it's fertile ground for nostalgia and also cultural schizophrenia. It's the site of slavery. It's the site of the trauma of slavery. It's also, it's also there's a vast sentimentality industry. So the brutalities of slavery and of Jim Crow are disassociated from the heinous acts. Plantation shutters are still an appealing window dressing. Mm -hmm. Southern bells are still a thing. It's still, it's still a popular idea. So by divorcing the images and the symbols of the past from their actual context adds another layer of complexity. Another way that I trouble the image is through artifice. And as, Southern, as a Southerner, we know about artifice. We paste it over everything, a veneer over everything. It's, it's part and parcel of being Southern. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. It allows me to assert, artifice and beauty allow me to assert class, identity, personal politics. And it also has the power to instill a portrait with with legalness, but critique it at the same, critique the subject at the same time. It also allows us to embody multiple people at one time. It's like when you're a child and you put on a costume and you become that person. So it's in a way it bridges the gap between materiality and symbolism. It allows us access to our imagination. So swimming pools have been part of my iconography for a really long time. Hmm. And they come and they go. And after a trip to California in 2017 to Palm Springs, I took a lot of photos of swimming pools and they started showing up in my work. I started making work from the photos I took and from collages I was making from the photos. 
And at the time, I was in a master's program, so I was doing a lot of reading and a lot of research. And I came across this book called Contested Waters by Jeff Wilsey, which goes into great length and detail about the history of segregation in our swimming pools. And I realized I can't really continue to paint pools and not address race. It was around that same time that I learned for the first time about the 1964 Monson Motor Lodge civil rights protests that basically pushed Johnson to pass the civil rights bill. And I started thinking, why did I never question this growing up? When I was in a swimming pool that was a public pool and there were no black children there. And then I realized all these municipalities, not just the one I grew up in in West Virginia, but all over the country, in my, within my lifetime, either closed their public pools, paved over them, anything to resist integration. And so I started thinking, I have to make work about this. And a lot of my white friends, especially my artist friends, were like, don't do that. That's a really bad idea. You're gonna, mm, I don't know about that. And then I got home from that summer in Maine, because it was a low residency master's program. And it was nine weeks of intensive work. And two days later, <coughs> 812 happened right here in our backyard. And I thought, I can no longer not make work about this. So I needed models to stage this work. Mm -hmm. So I enlisted three young models, daughters of a good friend of mine and their best friend. And ironically, at the same time, like the same exact month and everything, we were living out in Louisa at the time. And the house across the street from us, the people that lived there got evicted. The house was foreclosed on. And around this time, I was also opening my eyes to the rate of eviction in this country, and it's astounding. And a lot of it is really crazily unfair. I don't know why they got it. I don't know what happened. I don't know their personal story, but I know they left behind a lot of stuff on the front porch, in the backyard, everywhere. One thing they left behind was an above ground pool that I had been wanting to photograph. So I thought, here's my chance. I know it's trespassing, but I'll go and I'll ask for forgiveness later. So the girls came over. It was Memorial Day. It was crazy hot. <clears throat> I gave them flags to hold, tiki torches. I didn't give them a lot of direction. We went over to the above ground pool. I just wanted them to interact around the pool. And so I took a lot of photos that day. I also took photos of them around the, the statue of General Lee. Mm -hmm. So the first, one of the first works I made from that, from that time period is travel dress. And you don't have to get up, it's the one with the, with with Lee and the above ground pool. So that was the first time that I ever used transfers, photo transfers in my work, because I wanted to take these newspaper clippings from the Unite the Right rally, it was all over international news. I used that, I used images of Monticello, I used some Playboy magazines that I had. And I started putting that image together and I also embed my work with symbolism, if you hadn't noticed, but I mean, some of it's understated, like the, the water to me has always represented emotion and the, the greenery represents intuition. So even if you're not like, even if it doesn't come to your conscious, the, the symbolism is definitely in the work. And then another piece, so I'm gonna skip ahead a year. Um, we moved in that time, we moved ahead a century to a house that was the mid 20th century instead of the mid 19th century and with that house, with the house we're in now, we inherited a large satellite dish from the 70s or 80s, which is now dismantled. But the girls came over to model, that was summer, the next summer, and I didn't really know what I wanted them to do. We have a pond, and I wanted them to come over when the shadows were long in the late afternoon. And we were taking, I was taking photos of them. And then when Chloe walked, in front of the satellite dish, I caught her shadow, and I'm a sucker for light and shadow. And I was like, I have to paint that. So 
she held a tiki torch and the flag and I snapped the photo and then I created this painting and I thought the painting was done and I even had it photographed and then I came back to it a couple weeks later and I knew it needed something else to disrupt the image so I made the flag bleed. And it's titled Relic, which the satellite dish is a relic. I think a lot of our ideas about liberty and justice are relics, so it, it's questioning all of that. And I also think a satellite broadcasts out, and I keep thinking about the younger generation and all the messaging that they're getting and what they're inheriting, troubled legacy. And then the last painting I wanna talk about is up front, and you can see it after I finish talking, but if you haven't already seen it, it's the one with the glitter and the falcon. So that was the most recent painting I made before this show, like literally. Finished it, like I think it might have been still wet when I brought it in to, to install it. But while I was painting that, I was listening to the, the seminal um, book um, of essays by Joan Didion, Slouching Towards Bethlehem, which was cool because most of those essays, all of them I think were written in the mid to late 60s. And the image I was using is a woman, a black model from the 60s. It was a collage that I made from the model, a falconer's hand and the glove, and then a 1965 Better Homes and Gardens interior and I had collaged it and then I made the painting from the collage and then I was like what am I going to title this because I title everything and I feel like not titling something is a missed opportunity I mean I don't want it to be like a hammer but I want it to be a little entrance into the work into what I was thinking you know just a little little clue and I was like the falcon that's like too literal so I just googled the falcon and falconer to see what would come up and the first thing that came up was the poem by William Butler Yeats, mm -hmm. Slouching Towards Bethlehem. Mm -hmm. Actually, no, that's not the title of the poem, is it? No, that's not the title, Second Coming. Whew, thank you, Brian. <laughs> so I was reading the poem, I never, I knew W.B. Yeats, but I didn't know the poem, to be honest. So I'm like, why is this coming up? And I read it, and the first line, or the second line, is the falconer does not hear the falcon. The center will not hold. Things fall apart. And then the last line is something like, that rough beast whose hour has come around slouches towards Bethlehem to be born. And then it came full circle because I realized Joan Didion derived her title for slouching towards Bethlehem from that poem. It still gives me chills to like, to think about. That's one of those moments where you're like, well, that's so cool. So I was like, I'm going to title it The Falconer. That's what it is. And, and the poem itself is pretty dark. Um, he wrote it after World War I and after his wife had this, uh, um, ironically, or the Spanish flu. So it was written during the pandemic. And um, But I see that painting as a form of, of power and of reparation. So I guess finally what I want to say about this body of work is that my hope is that it holds up a mirror to our polite fictions that we have used to cover over racial trauma and to ask us to embody other possibilities and embody the past and the present together. Not look at the past and then look at the present, but look at them at the same time. And I feel like that is really the, the perhaps the only way to build a more hopeful and different future. Miss 1976, the 